but my personal and um, professional connections, like I said, um, are, are primarily with Russia. Uh, and also, is, as Brad so nicely said too, um, I'm happy to go. I have lots of slides. Um, and I always say, like a good academic, I can just keep talking um, uh, if you'd like me to. Um, but if you'd like to interject with questions um, or stop me, I, I have no problem at, at all with that. I'm used to um, a big introductory class with 200 plus students uh, who will interrupt with all kinds of great questions. Um, so I have no problem uh, with, with any kind of uh, questions or being interrupted at all. I want um, truly for this to be uh, something that's, that's useful for you. Um, uh, and I, I'm very grateful to be able to share my expertise on this because I do think it's such an important issue um, for people uh, to understand uh, and to know more about. So um, I have the, if you're on Zoom, you can see the slides, the link to the slides there. It's on the next slide as well. Or if you're here and you want to access these later, it's just on Google Drive. I'll keep it up there. It'll be available um, at a later time. I have hyperlinks, uh, links in the slides. So if you want to link to things that I mentioned later, um, you can do that. Um, so what I was going to talk about today, although as I said, I'm happy to go off script, um, was these three things. I was going to get some background uh, to Ukrainian politics, which is not something that uh, many people in the US know a lot about. Some do. Um, are there people, how many people here have personal connections to Ukraine? Okay, so I, if, um, you likely do know the background of this. Um, and if something sounds wrong, I, you should tell me that as well. Um, but if it sounds like not the characterization you would give, um, in all seriousness, um, I, you should interject. Um, so I, I was going to talk about Ukrainian democracy after communism um, as the most immediately relevant to understanding the current situation. Um, I told someone I was giving this talk uh, and said I was going to talk about the origins of the war from 2013 onwards. And they said, you can't do that. The origins are much deeper than that. It goes back hundreds, thousands of years even. And that's true, but I'll focus on the more um, current period. But there, of course, you can take a longer historical view. I'll take a shorter historical view. Um, for today, um, and then talk about what's happening, what has happened in just the past three months with Russia's war against Ukraine this year, um, and then what Russians think about the war, um, to the extent that people would like to know more about what Russians think about the war. Up until three months ago, and even to some extent now, we have reliable survey data about what Russians think. I, that's surprising to many people, and it, it's more surprising given the current situation um, this is likely, it's changing very quickly, um, and they can't ask polling questions about the war. They have to ask questions about the special military action. Um, but I can talk about that uh, more um, if, if people are interested, um, interested in that. Um, so I thought I would begin by talking about Ukrainian democracy after communism um, as giving some background to uh, where the conflict came from uh, and why this war is so deeply unjust that Russia is invading Ukraine um, and uh, that Ukraine is very much, of course, a sovereign uh, country. And so um, some of you will very well know this, but I, I, I'd like to start with a, a couple of things that I think are useful to know if you're reading about the conflict um, and new to uh, understanding the region, especially, of course, we, we don't it's hard to break the habit of saying the Ukraine, but it's not a region, it's its own country. And so for people that are from Ukraine, uh, this sounds like a very minor distinction to say, we say in Ukraine, not in the Ukraine, um, but it matters a lot uh, for people that are from the region and for acknowledging that it's a sovereign independent country, not a region of the Soviet Union or a Republic of the Soviet Union, uh, which of course does not exist uh, anymore. Um, and uh, you may have noted the Kiev, Kiev, uh, Kiev, Kiev uh, distinction. Of course, one is from the Ukrainian spelling, one's from the Russian spelling. There's uh, several different spellings of Zelensky's name. Um, a lot of news outlets are tending towards the double Y now, which is based on the Ukrainian spelling. Um, outlets like the New York Times are still using the single Y, which is based more on the Russian spelling, um, or you can use the IY depending on how you transliterate it. Um, this seems like trivia. But honestly, it's not for reasons that I'll come back more to. Um, and it, it, it's, it's significant uh, as an indicator of identity and the closeness, but also increasing differences um, uh, 
and how we refer to people from the region, I would note here that Zelensky is a native Russian speaker. Um, and so some of you may already know that, some of you may not. He's a native Russian speaker. He speaks Ukrainian fluently, of course, too, which is a distinct language and speaks English fluently as well. Um, but he grew up as a native Russian speaker. So he himself used the Russian spelling of his names in a lot of contexts before he became president. He was an actor, a comedian. The work he did was all in Russian or almost all in Russian. Um, Netflix, you can watch Sermon of the State, um, which is his show that's almost entirely in Russian. Um, but in his own press office um, has, has alternated in which spelling of his name they use, uh, the Ukrainian versus the Russian at different time periods. Um, and so those things are kind of an important, I, I think they may seem like trivia now, but hopefully not by the end of the presentation. And so I think it's good to keep in mind when understanding the current conflict, a timeline of Ukrainian politics after communism. Uh, and to sort of understand what's happened and where the conflict uh, has come from and where Ukrainian politics has stood. Because often and still uh, in the US and Western countries, Ukraine has been understood through the lens of Russia. And so it's been always understood through this lens of Russian politics and how mm -hmm. Russia has portrayed it um, when really it should be understood on its own uh, as its own sovereign country. Uh, and it's especially important to note um, that, uh, so there's the Kuchma presidency, uh, the first, um, uh, well, so that's not the whole uh, early period, but most of the 90s, uh, 94 to 2004, Leonid Kuchma uh, was the first uh, um, uh, long serving Ukrainian president after the Soviet Union dissolved. And this was a period of politics in Ukraine that was not perfect, uh, but it was a competitive democracy. The, there was a lot of corruption during this period. There were a lot of powerful business people who were labeled as oligarchs uh, sometimes. Um, and this is very similar to what was going on in Russia in the 90s. So in the 90s and in the early 2000s, Putin especially liked to point to Ukraine and say kind of this, oh, look at that crazy Ukrainian democracy. You don't want more democracy here. You'll be like Ukraine, right? Oh, they weren't ones to point fingers really. Russia had the same problems in the 1990s, but. It was an independent sovereign country. It was a competitive democracy. Yes, there were problems with corruption uh, and it was not a perfect democracy, um, but it was entirely, of course, an independent country. And then the first big event that helps explain and lead up to where we are in 2022 is the Orange Revolution um, that happens uh, in the fall of 2004 uh, and into 2005. And what happened was that when Kuchma was at the end of his second five-year term, uh, he wanted to pull the kind of trick that Yeltsin had in Russia and pick his successor. So Yeltsin handpicked Putin uh, to be his successor in many ways. He made him the prime minister and then Putin became acting president and then Putin was elected. Kuchma wanted to do something similar. And so uh, Kuchma wanted Yanukovych uh, to back him for the presidency and they hold the election uh, in 2004, uh, and, and Yanukovych initially wins by a very narrow margin. But there's mass protests about electoral fraud, which did happen. There was cheating in the 2004 election. Um, there's mass protests. That's the Orange Revolution. And it's one of what we call the color revolutions in this region, where there were mass protests about electoral fraud that actually removed power, the leaders from power. And so there's this mass protest that removes Yanukovych and Yushchenko ends up winning in that election. This is very significant for what's going to happen later on. Um, Yanukovych was also uh, the more pro-Russian president uh, and, and that became increasingly true over time that Yanukovych was the more pro-Russian candidate uh, and Yushchenko was seen as the more pro-Europe uh, and pro, you could say pro-Ukrainian um, candidate. It's a bit of a simplification, but Ukraine in the 1990s and 2000s, there was always this pro-Europe, pro-Russia side. It's telling that we even have that divide, that there's that Russia's not on the Europe side, but there was the eastern part of the country more heavily supported Yanukovych, the western part of Ukraine supported Yushchenko, and it's been this long-standing deep political polarization in the country. That has always existed in the post-communist era that political polarization. 
And so when you had the Orange Revolution, that's Yanukovych, that's his party of regions. Um, some of you probably uh, know, remember the name Paul Manafort. So, okay. uh, so Manafort, um, who was convicted uh, of a crimes, uh, one of those crimes was being paid by the party of regions, being paid something like $12 million that he didn't report to the IRS. That was the crime, um, is that he didn't report it um, to advise Yanukovych as the pro-Russian candidate. Um, and so uh, Yanukovych is on this pro-Russia, Eastern Ukrainian side. And then you had people like Yushchenko and Timoshenko on the other side, on the more pro-Europe side. Um, and, and really like, I mean, you couldn't, you could not write fiction that was stranger than what actually happens in Ukrainian politics and, the, and, the two, and which is more tragic. Um, then what happens, so Yushchenko gets poisoned during this election runoff. And so you can see the before, after, and then he does, he did survive. Um, almost certainly Yanukovych had something to do with this. At the very least, um, security forces on the side of Yanukovych were responsible for poisoning Yushchenko and trying to kill him in the run up to the election in 2004. So Yushchenko ends up winning after there's mass protests against a candidate that tried to kill him in the run up to the election. And Yushchenko, because of the way the Ukrainian government system is set up, Yushchenko for a period of time has to appoint Yanukovych as his prime minister <laughs> because they have a, what's called a semi-presidential system. They have a president and a prime minister and the only candidate Yushchenko could get Berada, the um, legislature to approve for a period was Yanukovych. So Yushchenko I, I had the odds stacked against him and didn't have a great presidency. He wasn't able to get a lot done, <laughs> in part because the person that tried to kill him had to be his prime minister for a period of time. Um, and so you can see here, this is, um, I think, shows very clearly the political polarization that existed in Ukraine and has existed in the 1990s and, be, and forward. The blue in the eastern part of the country is where Yanukovych won a majority, in some cases more than 90 percent. And the orange and yellow parts are where Yushchenko won a, a majority of the vote in 2004. This maps on very well uh, to um, the regions of Ukraine that are more supportive of going towards Russia for trade and security, and the regions that would prefer to go towards Europe and the European Union and NATO. Although I, I would emphasize that Ukraine has never been officially considered for NATO membership, never. That it's not. Um, but the Western part being the more pro-Europe and the Eastern being the more pro-Russian. So that divide is real. Uh, and in this sense, Russia as an outsider, as an outside power that wants to control Ukrainian politics, has always tried to exploit that to interfere in Ukrainian domestic politics, um, both to destabilize the country, but also to make sure that the Russian government has influence over the Ukrainian political system. Um, and so that hampered Ukrainian democracy, the corruption that existed, which existed in many post-communist countries, including Russia, um, hampered democracy in the 1990s and 2000s. And also the fact that when, um, in Ukraine, when you win the presidency, the president gets to appoint all the governors of the regions, of the oblasts. So it's, the stakes are really high. The incentive to cheat is high because the stakes are so high. You get everything when you win the presidency. And that's probably not a great way to set up um, the system. So that's my Don Nizaliashnisti, um, Independence Square. Um, in 2004, you see the orange flags. It's massive. I've been to my Don Nizaliashnisti. It's huge. The fact that they could sustain this level of protest for this long um, it is really remarkable <laughs> um, and, and should have given Yanukovych and Putin a hint about what they would face in the future if they kept trying to do what they were doing. Um, but it didn't. So, we have the Yushchenko presidency. It doesn't go terribly well. Yushchenko doesn't get a lot done. Yushchenko serves one term, and then Yanukovych does win the election in 2010. Not a perfect election. There was cheating. He probably won. Um, these were very close races between, if you if I went back to that map between Yanukovych and Yushchenko and the pro-Russia, pro-Europe side, these were very close presidential races. Um, so Yanukovych wins in 2010, 
It's a five-year term. You'll notice he only makes it three years though. Um, uh, so then there's the Euromaidan movement. Uh, so we've got the Orange Revolution 2004, Euromaidan happens in 2013. Euromaidan uh, is about Yanukovych pulling out of an EU trade association agreement, uh, which I, I, I try to imagine uh, and from sort of a perspective of, you all come from different perspectives, but if you were coming from a perspective of the US, imagining that a government could fall over pulling out of a trade agreement, right? That there would be mass sustained protests over that tells you how deeply polarized Ukrainian politics was. Yanukovych in 2013 had been playing the EU and Russia against each other for better economic aid and trade packages. And he'd been stringing the EU along and made it look like he was gonna sign the EU agreement. It wasn't joining the EU. It was just a better trade deal <laughs> to move towards the European Union. It was not even to consider membership yet in the European Union. So Yanukovych strings along the EU and keeps upping the offer from Russia. From Russia says, we'll give you this better trade deal, this better trade deal. We'll give you a little more money. We'll throw in a little more. At the last minute, Yanukovych pulled out of signing the EU Trade Association Agreement. And there are mass protests in Kyiv and the Western part of the country. Not so much in the Eastern part, which is the more pro-Russian part of the country. But this is the Euro Maidan, that's the Euro part of the Maidan. Maidan is square in Ukrainian um, and the Euro part, Euro Maidan, um, because of the EU agreement. And Yanukovych decides that the way to handle this is to call out, um, they have the Berkut special police forces and to order them to shoot protesters um, uh, and uh, to kill them. And so Yanukovych attempts to crack down on these protests, he keeps it up. Um, there's as many people or more as in the Orange Revolution and Maidan as um, They keep, it's amazing what the Ukrainian people have done. It, it's amazing the bravery of people who kept protesting despite what Yanukovych did. Yanukovych flees the country and flees to Russia, which is presumably where he still is. I don't think he's been seen in public in a while, uh, but uh, flees to Russia. When that happens, I mean, I, I think that Putin was beside himself with anger <laughs> that his candidate got driven out of the country. So Putin says this is unconstitutional. It's not democratic. It should never have happened. The Ukrainians are oppressing the Russians in Eastern Ukraine and ethnic Russians. That's a false and tricky claim to explain, but, um, but it, it was not true. Putin used it as a, a justification to annex Crimea. Um, initially, <laughs> There were people, um, um, ununiformed Russian soldiers in Eastern Ukraine. And Putin said, no, 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 they're not Russian soldiers. And then like a month or so later, they made a documentary for state TV saying, oh yeah, of course we sent in soldiers. That's what we were doing all along and we saved people, it's great. And now we're in, and so Crimea and Donbass are two separate conflicts. Russia has taken over Crimea unjustly, not recognized by many countries in the world, but Russia has set up government and administrative uh, administration in Crimea. Russia controls Crimea. They shouldn't, but they do. The Donbass conflict is technically two separatist movements, um, which is Luhansk and Donetsk. And officially, Russia is saying they don't want to take over Luhansk and Donetsk. Um, they, they just um, are backing the separatists who are fighting against, and this is false, but they say they're fighting against an oppressive Ukrainian government that's conducting genocide against ethnic Russians. That is not true, <laughs> that is made up. Um, but what Russia claims in its own state propaganda is um, that the deaths and atrocities occurring, they just claim that Ukrainians are doing them, that they're killing their own people. Um, uh, and consistently Russia claims this. Um, it, it's their go-to explanation for what's happening. And who was killing the people? So this gets, forces that are, are conducting are committing the atrocities and killing people um, but of course there is fighting on two sides so yes ukrainian forces are responsible for deaths but when we're talking about civilian deaths and shellings and bombings like that that target civilians um, that's that's russian forces so yeah please i had to answer the question when russian troops were crossing the ukrainian territory they had no identification whatsoever on their uniforms so they claim to be Ukrainian fighting amongst each other. 
and they claimed to be separatists that were from Ukraine. And when they had they had the referendum for Crimea, they technically had a referendum to ask Crimeans, the people in Crimea, what they wanted to do. Um, they didn't give an option to stay with Ukraine. They're like, do you want to be independent or join Russia? Which, there's another option there. Um, and they let Russian soldiers stationed in Crimea uh, vote in the referendum. And so now Crimea, there probably would have been support from people in Crimea at that point to join Russia. Um, if the referendum probably would have passed fairly, not with the like 90% plus mm -hmm. approval, but it probably would have gone through. Anyways, um, and most of Crimea was ethnic Russians because in Soviet times, they drove out the Crimean Tatars and put ethnic Russians there. So uh, they put Russians there and then claimed Russia had to take it because Russians were there. It is, it's a bit of a, it's a very convoluted kind of historical justification. Um, so you're on my dawn. I, I mean, I've already talked about this, so I don't, I don't want to spend too much time on it. Um, uh, but you're on my dawn happens. Yanukovych, please. And um, after this, um, which here, sorry, I'm going through this a bit too fast. Um, so there's the protests, the special police forces that try to suppress it. Yanukovych flees to Russia. They open up. It's a joke. I, I don't have many jokes in here because uh, it's not a topic that. Uh, close with that, but there's a new tourist attraction, Yanukovych's opulent palace, which had like peacocks and I don't know, golden toilets or something. I, whatever you do when you're a corrupt dictator. Um, and so that brings us to here, um, to pretty much the present time. So Poroshenko, um, who was a chocolate magnet um, or business uh, oligarch uh, in Ukraine, uh, was a wealthy businessman, ran for office and won the presidency, served one term. Poroshenko, like um, his predecessors, had a lot of trouble cracking down on um, corruption in Ukraine, was faced with this new, at that time, new conflict with Russia that was sort of confined to the East um, for the most part during the Poroshenko presidency. Um, and so Poroshenko uh, loses by a big margin to Zelensky in 2019. Um, Zelensky wins by a big margin, especially by Ukrainian presidential standards. Um, he's an outsider, he's a comedian and a, a media personality, TV personality. Um, Zelensky's from Eastern Ukraine, he's a native Russian speaker, but speaks fluent Ukrainian. Um, Poroshenko did try to kind of give him a hard time in the election about his Ukrainian maybe not being quite good enough. I, I speak Russian and not Ukrainian. Um, and so I can't testify to that myself, but from people who are native Ukrainian speakers, what I've heard is that Zelensky's Ukrainian is fine. Like you can, sometimes you might hear an accent, sometimes he might use a Russian word where he could have used a Ukrainian word, but it's is that his Ukrainian um, is perfectly fine. And it's not that this issue of like the language, Russian or Ukrainian, um, many people who live in Ukraine speak both. They're both Slavic languages, but they're distinct languages. Um, they're distinct languages. Many people speak both. Um, in the eastern part of the country, you would find more Russian speakers or native Russian speakers. In the western part, you might find people that only speak Ukrainian or primarily speak it. But lots of people switch back and forth uh, between them, including Zelensky, um, which I, this is really telling uh, that you have a native Russian speaker um, who's also going back and forth between these two. Increasingly, like if you hear him in press conferences, feel pretty seamlessly and strategically, of course, switch between Russian, Ukrainian, and English, depending on what audience he's hoping is paying attention to him. Um, yeah. What languages are being taught to elementary school children? It depends on where you are in the country, but Ukrainian is taught in many of the, uh, most of the public schools, Ukrainian would be the main language, but in the East, there are um, Russian language schools that would be the, yeah. Ukrainian school? Yes, and they use the Cyrillic alphabet. It's a little bit different from the Russian when they've got some letters that the Russian Cyrillic alphabet doesn't use. So it's, kind of a dialect, sort of. it's not a dialect, it's a distinct language. So um, I speak Russian, uh, I, I call my Russian high functioning, uh, but I speak Russian professionally in a professional sense, so like pretty well. Um, and I've gone to Ukraine, I've been in Kyiv, and I feel like I can maybe understand like 20, 25%. Like I can get a lot, but not, uh, certainly I'm not understanding everything. Um, yeah, there's a fair number of cognates, but it would be like comparing French and Spanish a little bit, right? Those are both romance languages. There's a lot of cognates, but they're not the same. They're not dialects of each other. Um, How do you define an oligarch? 
Oh, it's not an official term uh, that has an official definition, but just a really well business person. Um, and typically in Ukraine, Russia, other post-communist countries, the oligarchs are the really wealthy business people that profited off of the privatization of state-owned companies and resources. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's, it's really wealthy business people that profited in the 1990s especially from privatizing formerly state-owned firms and resources. Do they have political influence? Yes, a great deal. <laughs> yeah. they connected to politics. I'm sorry. They cannot be oligarchs if they are not connected to politics. So, in a lot of people say, like it goes both ways, right? Like you can't maybe be a successful oligarch with having political connections, Supposedly. and you're not going to be a successful politician without having a backing <laughs> from at least some of those people. Okay. Yeah. And you know, I've been wondering, reading all about the oligarchs in the last few months, what does the average Russian, how aware are they of these huge jumps and these, you know, how aware are they? They're very aware. Uh, and uh, Russians um, are aware that there's this elite group that has a lot of money. Uh, and if you look at polling data over time in the 90s and 2000s, um, Russians do not approve of really high levels of inequality, and they think the state should do something about it. Um, but expectations of what the state will actually do are so low that Putin has been able to get by with promising a lot and delivering a little. Uh, and uh, so they know, and they're not happy about it, but what can you do? Who else are you going to vote for? I mean, are you willing to protest over it? Like, the, the, the options are limited. Um, yeah, but they do know uh, for sure. And Ukrainians as well. Um, so then we get to 2022. Um, so Zelensky became president in 2019. He really has not been president for very long. And he's now been president during a pandemic, an ongoing war. The war he, he took the presidency knowing that the war was happening. It was continuing. Um, and so Russia invaded on February 24th, 2022. Uh, and many people, myself included, thought that one likely scenario is Russia would play this to the brink and then back off because it didn't make any sense to launch a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. They couldn't afford it, didn't have an army for it, it would destroy their economy. Um, all those things ha have proved true about why it was not, why it was an irrational choice from that perspective for Russia, but um, Putin may have gotten faulty security intelligence. Putin appears very committed to trying to destroy Ukraine or take over Ukraine um, uh, at all costs. And so Russia did uh, invade the Western part of the country on February 24th, 2022. And amazingly, uh, Russia was not actually able to take the Western part of the country. They never could take heat. Um, so the Russian military and army grossly underperformed, even by the low standards of what we might expect from the invasion. Uh, and the Ukrainian army and defense forces uh, really overperformed uh, and held out. I mean, in the long term, the Ukrainian military can't hold out. So it's sort of a war of attrition of who's uh, willing to sort of sustain the most costs for the longest to some extent. But Russia so bungled the Western invasion um, that they've retreated to the East now. Um, and so I'll skip past, I, I think this, I've already talked about this, Zelensky, of course, very, uh, Putin is claiming that he is not a legitimate leader of Ukraine. So since Yanukovych uh, was driven out in 2013, Putin has said that was unconstitutional, undemocratic, and there's none of these leaders are valid. So one theory is that Putin was going to try to bring Yanukovych back in as president if he could take heat. Um, and he's not been able to do that. But Zelensky won in a competitive free and fair election, has been uh, remarkably uh, brave and staying in the country, in Kyiv, very vocal, very prominent, um, and, and did not have to do that. He had options uh, to flee the country uh, when this started and did, did not do that. Um, and so this, of course, has caused an enormous humanitarian crisis. I'm guessing that most of you, given that you're here, know this uh, already. And as you can guess, I, it's, I, I can't even wrap my head around the numbers, to be honest. Um, Five million Ukrainians have fled. This is the biggest refugee crisis we've ever seen in Europe. 
um, to date. 7.7 um, million displaced within the country. The UN is estimating that the uh, number of refugees by the end of this year will probably reach 8 million people who fled the country. Um, it's most of them are women and children uh, because they weren't letting men over the age of 18 and under the age of, I think the cutoff was 60. Um, although I might be wrong, that seems kind of high. Um, but there was, a, they, men had to stay uh, to fight in the country. So it's mostly women and children that fled to nearby um, countries. Um, as of now, these numbers are, are probably low, um, but at least um, 2,729 Ukrainian civilian deaths. The mayor of um, uh, Mariupol claims that 10,000 <laughs> civilians were killed there. Um, I don't know that that's been verified, but that doesn't seem unlikely to me. Um, of course, there's the pictures from Bucha, which are horrific um, targeted killings of civilians who were not in any way armed uh, or fighting. Uh, Bucha is a, a suburb of Kyiv. Um, and so uh, in Russia, immediately claimed that Russian forces left the day before it happened um, or right before it happened. So Ukrainians did this to themselves, so, which is it's fantastical that that would be the explanation. Um, and Mariupol was, of course, been a lot in the news um, because of the bombardment of Mariupol and also Kharkiv, although things in Kharkiv are maybe getting a bit better now uh, in the East. Um, at the so it's probably higher than this, but at least 15,000 Russian soldiers killed in, in, in like the first two months, uh, which is astonishing um, that this number of soldiers were killed uh, in, in the first two months. Um, there's a quote that's attributed to Stalin. I don't know that he actually said it, but it's attributed to Stalin that um, one death is a tragedy, a million is a number. As I kind of hate giving numbers for this because it, it doesn't, I don't think it really gives the magnitude of, of what's happened um, to just give numbers, but um, the numbers themselves are appalling. Um, so there's a couple ways you can, I, like there's a couple good interactive maps um, tracking the invasion and you can sort of see what the most recent intelligence is about where Russian forces are. The New York Times has a good one. The BBC has a really good one um, as well. And now where we stand with the war is that um, Russia was so unsuccessful. And it's, it's been, they, they claim they did what they needed to in the West. They demilitarized the Western part of the country. So success, um, not really. Um, and they've mostly retreated to the Eastern part of the country. So Russia already controlled Crimea. Um, they're uh, focusing on the Eastern parts, especially Luhansk and Donetsk. Um, I suspect that this fall and winter in Eastern Ukraine are going to be very, very bad for a variety of reasons. Um, the most recent news is that Russia is trying to hold up food supplies uh, being shipped to Ukraine and they're trying to leverage that to get some of the sanctions lifted to say they won't let food in to certain parts of the country. Uh, in the West, a number of countries have rallied to say, well, you can use this route and we'll get food through another, uh, through another way. Um, I don't think this is gonna help Russia get sanctions lifted or its international reputation to try to hold food for civilians hostage um, to get it lifted, um, but that's the current strategy. And, and since I'm giving this at a library, I thought I should give suggestions of things to read. Um, uh, so Sergei Yakelchik, uh, who is Ukrainian himself, um, the conflict in Ukraine, this was written back in 2015, uh, when the beginning of this conflict, but not the most recent iteration. Um, Andrei, Andrei Korpov, um, who writes um, in both Ukrainian and Russian, but his adult novels are written primarily in Russian, um, I think. I don't think the adult ones have been written in Ukrainian. There's lots of translations, anything by him. Uh, and he's almost daily giving some kind of interview or doing <clears> some <throat> kind of event right now. Um, he's got a great series called Death and the Penguin, um, about set in the 1990s in Kiev. Uh, which has to do with the oligarchs and corruption. And there's a journalist who's writing obituaries before people die and realizes it's like a hit list from the mafia. Um, these are too good. Uh, these are in English uh, or have English language versions um, for Ukrainian sources. Um, and if you want news coverage from Russia, that's not hard to find. Um, but the Moscow Times uh, was an independent news source from Russia. They've ceased most of their live reporting. Their journalists fled the country. So there are not a lot of independent, uh, very, very few. Independent journalists are based in Russia right now from any kind of foreign source or domestic source, but they're continuing their coverage by kind of reposting 
things from abroad. Um, and Google Translate means you can read all kinds of, of Russian propaganda if you would like to. Um, I don't recommend it really. Um, uh, but yeah. How can yes. we gauge your Russian public opinion about all this? Oh, I would be happy to talk about that. I have a whole bunch of slides about it. Um, so what I think is really interesting is not that long ago, in the summer of 2021, I, this is reliable survey data. I think this is, these are probably true numbers. <coughs> Only 8% of Russians thought Russia should send military forces to fight Ukraine in December of 2021. Public opinion does not by any account appear to have been driving Putin's decision to invade the country. Putin appears to have been very committed to doing this of his own, his historical fiction, which should win some sort of award, the historical fiction that he's weaving right now. Um, part of what Putin has, uh, has been saying is that because of the, it's, it's very convoluted, but because of the Kievan Rus, and that sort of being the shared historical legacy from hundreds, thousands of years ago, um, that Ukrainians are really Russians, essentially, that Russia is always supposed to have been, uh, had control of Ukraine, and so that Russia has a right to Ukraine. Um, although I think if he's right, it means Ukraine should be able to take over Russia, not the other way around, <laughs> um, if that's where the origin is. Um, but in any case, it's just, it's, it's fantasy. It's not real. Um, um, so only 8% thought Russia should send military troops, 9% thought that Russia should train or equip separatist forces. Um, but you can see there was a lot of skepticism about NATO. 75% of people did think NATO was out to get Russia. NATO, as the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, was originally formed to counter the Soviet power. So it is not without any basis that Russia would be concerned about the growth of the security organization of NATO. But Ukraine was never considered for NATO membership. What when Russia invaded this year, they said, we want to take off the table the possibility that you ever think of the idea of maybe admitting Ukraine into NATO. Um, and it wasn't because Ukraine was actually being considered for that. But there is a lot of skepticism for this. Um, but what we can see if we look at Putin's approval ratings is that he may have had uh, a good reason to think he could get people to rally around this if he did it. So just before Putin invades in 2014, his approval rating had dipped to a historic low. And then it shoots up to like the highest it had ever been, almost 90%. That number might have been slightly inflated, but was probably genuinely really high. His approval ratings were probably really high after the first invasion in 2014, um, and we see the same thing here. So his approval had gone, it, it shoots up, and then it's like, eh, the economy's not doing great, lots of reasons Putin's approval goes down, down here, and it's shot up since he's invaded 2022 in the past couple months. So for now, Russians have rallied around the flag. Um, they didn't push for it, but yeah, yeah, yes. So we have a question from Zoom. Can you give some clarity on the Hunter Biden issue and the holding up of aid to Ukraine by Trump? When I did this talk in the Netherlands, someone asked the same thing. Um, uh, so I mean, a different world in regards to Ukraine and Europe would likely be leading the aid to Ukraine, not the US with Europe. Um, and so with the first impeachment of Trump, so Trump gets impeached twice, but never convicted. Um, Trump withholding aid to Ukraine because he called Zelensky and wanted Zelensky to open an investigation into the Bidens. And he wanted, and Hunter Biden was on the board of a gas company in Ukraine. Um, and he, he wanted to show that there had been undue influence by Ukrainians in the 2016 election, not the Russians. And to deflect away from the accusations against Trump. And so Trump did actually, there's evidence of this phone call and what he did subsequently, withheld aid to Ukraine that the US was already giving after the 2014 invasion um, because he wanted this investigation opened um, uh, against the Bidens. So had Trump been reelected, I don't think we would have the foreign policy we had, but I mean, that's not anything that's like shocking or overly revealing. Um, Okay, so uh, Lavada is a non-state owned, a private polling organization. 
that is very bravely continuing to do a lot of polling work in Russia. Um, and we'll see how long that lasts. I myself have run uh, surveys through Levada. I think that they're very reliable, they're very professional, they're independent, they're not state owned. Um, and in this question, they have a Russian language version of their website and an English language version. And it's not like English is the language of spies, like the Kremlin can't see what they publish on the English language website, but they put, they emphasize different things and they present different results depending on the Russian version and the English version. But here, <clears throat> they just ask the general question, are you worried about present events in Ukraine? Which could mean lots of things, lots of things. Um, and we see that a lot of people are very or somewhat worried. Older people tend to be the most worried uh, about what's happening in Ukraine. But again, what does worried mean? Um, and so if we go to, um, do you personally support the actions of the armed forces in Ukraine? I can't call it a war. So the actions of the armed forces or Levada in Russian will put in quotations special military action, which is Levada's way of saying like, you know, we all know this is a war, right? Um, and so if you look at support, uh, the support for it, it is really pretty high. Um, sorry, I'll go back here. Again, it's highest among older people, um, 64% saying definitely yes. But if you look at the total number of people who say definitely yes and rather yes, right? That's the vast majority of respondents. So Russians have rallied around this. You do have to understand they're, they're being presented with an increasingly limited uh, media. It was not competitive before the war started. It's even less so now. And it's like an alternate reality. If you, uh, so like right before this talk, I went to the Komsomolska uh, Pravda, kp.ru. It's like the old Pravda newspaper. Like it's Pravda is truth. That's the so that was the Soviet era main newspaper. Comes the Moscow Pravda is the Poskamia era one, and um, what they were emphasizing the front page news on Comes the Moscow Pravda was about how the central bank was taking steps to to make sure that the sanctions didn't hurt the economy, uh, and then below that how Ukrainians are killing their own people. Um, but yeah, sorry. so I I would be question at the same time comments about the statistics. So. Information in Russia, we know you mentioned this. There is no independent channels, there is no independent newspaper. How people are getting information. So this is the question: how they are collecting these statistics. If you and me doing statistics in Russia, and we call somewhere on deep page in Russia and Babushka answers the question on the phone, and you ask this question, she does not know what's going on in Ukraine. She does. So ages, when you say younger people probably have internet, they YouTube, they have more information, they know how to find it. I don't know how you mentioned a few times that it's reliable, but I'm yeah. a little bit concerned. So I think you're right to be skeptical. Um, yes. So a lot of the Russian polling organization. So it's Russians that are doing this polling. Oh, so it's native Russian speakers. Um, it used to be they did a lot of it in person. Now it's more telephone, and they've started doing some online, but these are not online. Um, these are almost certainly telephone polls being done by a Russian polling agency by Russia. By Russia. Yeah. It's a nationally representative survey. Um, and so that's why I say it's reliable and that it's not just sort of like a random poll on a website or something. Um, and the breakdown by ages is really interesting. Most people in Russia get the bulk of their news from television. Younger people might be more likely to seek out alternative news sources, but the average person in general in any country does not seek out alternative news sources. So, uh, because I mean, who goes and looks for news they disagree with, right? Uh, like, or, I mean, you have to be pretty active or pretty invested. If you have a VPN in Russia, you likely can still get Western media if you go look for it. Right. If you are interested, if you're interested, right, which is not most people. So you could, but most people are not. Uh, and most people are relying heavily on TV uh, for for their news. So and we know what the TV does. Yeah, I, I mean, and those are these are state owned channels, either directly or indirectly. Tina, do you think those numbers should be lower? Or, I mean, why do you think that? I think it's been a real I think they're afraid. And that increasingly is a concern is that people are giving honest answers. Yeah. 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 yeah.
Yeah. The um, he kept talking about the Nazi angle. Uh, yeah. That would certainly affect the older people who would remember that succinctly. And is there any more to that than uh, than that? In other words, no, it was just a rabble rousing. So there are neo Nazis in Ukraine. There are also neo Nazis in Russia, um, but they don't control the government in either case. Um, I don't think. So Zelensky is Jewish himself. I don't even think that's the most relevant point to debunk that conspiracy theory. But um, Zelensky is Jewish himself. Uh, but the conspiracy theory from Putin and from the Russian government is that neo Nazis are running the Ukrainian government and are committing genocide against Russians in the East. And that's it, it's just made up. I, I mean, it, it's hard to debunk something that doesn't have a basis, right? Because it's like, what proof do you have that it's not true? It's like, there's no proof that it is true. Like there was never any basis for that claim. Their basis in Russia is that there are neo-Nazi groups in Ukraine that have been active at certain times, um, not elected to office, but Russia also has active neo-Nazi groups. So um, that's, uh, yeah, so do, uh, uh, sadly they exist in many countries. Um, and so the Nazi theory is, it's to discredit Zelensky um, and, and the people around him. Yeah. Um, so I have some other slides here. I, I mean, I don't have to spend too much time on these, but they, they did dig deeper on the Levada surveys into why do you support the actions of the Russian army or why don't you support? For people who said they didn't support the actions of the Russian army in Ukraine, um, they gave them an open-ended, why don't you? Uh, most people said, I'm against war, civilians are dying as the most common one. The second most common answer was it's a different country. 4% um, said we, this is Russia this is saying we initiated the war. Only 4% of the people who don't support the war don't support it because they think Russia started it. As their main reason. Yes, as their I mean, main could be. Yeah. Um, and so, I think that even Russians that are not supportive of the war or who would be inclined to oppose it think that Zelensky's done bad things, that the Ukrainian government's corrupt, that the Ukrainians have also done bad things. And so the real danger is that Kremlin propaganda infects Western news media sources, I think, and convinces people like, oh, there's two sides. It's a territorial dispute. Ah, it's just one of those ethnic disputes that we hear about. Like, no, Russia invaded Ukraine and made up a reason to do it. Uh, it's there are not two sides in the sense that they're like the Ukrainians were doing something wrong and then the Russians kind of did something. No, it's just Russian aggression uh, against Ukraine. I think the real danger is that the longer it goes on, the longer people are like, well, I, maybe the Ukrainians are being too inflexible. Maybe they like, um, and that's not really what the situation is. Um, so and I also have here, it's kind of blocked by the, maybe I can move the Zoom thing so you can. I think I can. There we go. Oh, yeah. Um, why do you think Russia started the special op so they put special yes. operation <clears throat> in Ukraine? Um, and most people think that it's to protect Russian people in Ukraine. So uh, Russians and Ukrainians are distinct ethnic groups, distinct languages. They are both Slavic. Um, they are both um, Orthodox traditionally. Although the, church, the orth, Ukrainian Orthodox Church is split from the Russian Orthodox Church, right? uh, that, that that happened even before the war started. But um, and and they do share some historical roots. So this was not a politicized ethnic divide where Ukrainians and Russians killed each other and like this was a thing. It's not the same situation as the former Yugoslavia, say where there were historical ethnic disputes that, that got politicized in the same way. It's new for ethnic Russians and ethnic Ukrainians to be, they have politicized an ethnic difference that, that was not politicized in many ways for a very long time. Um, but most Russians do think that they, that that's why Russia did this, was to protect Russians. Um, and I can say this from, so I've been going to Russia since 2002, the um, friends that I've had since then, the family I stayed with in 2002 as an undergrad, I kept going back and I always stayed with them. I stayed with them in 2019. Um, uh, they, I mean, they've sent me these clips of like, it's the propaganda clips, right? Of like how ethnic Russians are being killed in Eastern Ukraine. Um, and 
I was I was telling someone right before this started uh, when I first went to Russia, um, there was um, Andre who's in the, the family that I'm close to um, was a month old. He'd just been born uh, and he's turning 19 this summer and he's in the Russian army. Um, I don't think he's in Ukraine yet, but I, I, that's why I, this feels very personal to me, but I hear all of these stories about many Ukrainians have family in Russia and the Russian family will call their own families and say, no, no, come on. It's not a war. It's not happening. That's not what's going on in Ukraine. Because there is now this deep divide of two different realities of what's happening and why. Um, so where are we now with the war? I feel like I've been talking too long. So I'm just going to put this up here and then maybe ask if you have questions. Um, uh, so right now, there's a lot of international support for Ukraine. Um, as of now, no other country wants to go to war directly with Russia over Ukraine. I don't think that's likely to change. The U.S. alone has committed $53 billion uh, to Ukraine, um, and over 40 countries are providing military aid. Lots of stories of like even small countries sending like their one fighter jet, right, or their one military transport jet to Ukraine. Um, so Russia is focusing on the east. What we're going to hear a lot about are these energy wars. Um, Russia did this before the war. They've used, they've shut off gas to vulnerable countries in the winter. People die when they do that, and that happens. They'll do it again. Um, and so they've already ended the natural gas supply to Poland and Bulgaria. And Poland, which is very actively trying to help uh, Ukraine and has a lot of Ukrainian refugees. Um, it would be great if Europe could decrease its usage of Russian gas, but I, it, that's going to be very hard to do. Um, Russia was, is already in selective default on its foreign debt, not because it didn't have the money to pay it, but it couldn't access its dollars because of sanctions. And so they didn't, the IMF actually didn't know how to classify this because usually when you default on your debt, it's because you can't pay it. Russia could pay it. They just couldn't access the dollar to pay it in dollars. So Russia started demanding that countries pay them in rubles, which didn't work. Um, <laughs> that's why they ended the natural gas supply to Poland and Bulgaria. They told them to pay them, and they, they told them to pay them in rubles, and they were like, no. Um, <laughs> Russia had already done things to insulate itself from the global market in the sense that its foreign debt was only 17% of its GDP, which is super low. Lots of developed countries, their foreign debt's over 100% of their GDP, which is fine as long as you can pay the debt down. It's not like a personal credit card, but um, yeah, the economic projections are not great in Russia. The question is how long does it take? So you've got like people sometimes talk about um, the refrigerator and the television, right? Like which will win out. If the television is telling you the war is justified, but there's no food in your refrigerator, like how long does that balance stand, right? It, it could be a while. Um, and Russia is very much an authoritarian country now. That breaks my heart <laughs> uh, because I feel from 2002 to the present, to really this war started, I spent 20 years trying to convince people, or Americans especially, that Russia was not the Cold War stereotype they had in their heads. Like it was becoming more modern. It was stable. There was a lot of wealth. There was a lot of great things. Like it wasn't perfect, but there was, you could go there, you could travel, it was safe. And in three months, that has all been blown up. So um, and for Ukraine, more critically, the most important thing is that Ukrainian people are being killed. Not that, I, I mean, it, it's all, there's layers and layers of tragedy here, but um, yeah. And I think, I, I mean, I'll stop there. Slava um, Ukraine. Glory to Ukraine. Uh, uh, but I, yeah, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, please. Uh, I was wondering if you could speak to the situation in Transnistria and Moldova. Yeah. And really there, but yeah. So I'm cautiously optimistic that Russia will not go into Transnistria and Moldova. Um, Transnistria is a long-standing territorial dispute where there's a lot of ethnic Russians um, and has had a separatist movement from Moldova. Moldova is a very small, poor country, but one of the poorest countries in Europe. And it has this separatist region with ethnic Russians. So the concern has been that the Russian government will go, like if they take Ukraine, they'll go take Transnistria. They'll go take part of uh, Southeast Lithuania, maybe. Who is stating that? Who is stating what? You're restating in Europe what was the domino theory in Asia, that if they take Maybe. Ukraine, they're going to take Moldova. There's nothing strategic in Moldova. 
There was well, nothing strategic. So there is, but there's nothing. Well, there is such strategic things in Ukraine. Correct. But they couldn't take it, and their army was overextended. So I'm cautiously optimistic that they're not. There was a concern that if they could take Ukraine, they would keep going. And given what Putin was doing, I think that he could have irrationally continued on that path. I don't think it would make sense for Russia as a country or be right or anything like that. Because they couldn't take Ukraine, which is astonishing. Like that is the silver lining. It's not a good situation now and there's still a war, but like they couldn't take Ukraine. Um, I don't think that they have the capacity to go start trying to take over other territories. Like they just can't. I mean, they've lost at least 15,000 troops, at least 300 officers. Um, they've had some people from the upper echelons of the military just disappear. Like they're not in good shape to go invade other countries. So I'm cautiously optimistic that that would not be um, a big uh, a big risk. Transnistria itself is not valuable. It's valuable as um, real estate for an oil pipeline. So and that's often like the case. Like there might not be natural resources in the territory they want to take over, but they'd love to put an oil <laughs> pipeline through it or a gas pipeline or something like that. Um, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, non-aggression is the core principle of the United Nations Charter and has been the cornerstone of international law since World War II. Why could you think that he could do a like aggression and that there wouldn't be protests from the rest of the world? I think he got bad information about how easy it would be to take Ukraine. Um, that is the most plausible theory to me. I don't know there's definitive evidence of it, but the most plausible theory to me is he thought he could take Ukraine quickly and maybe bring back someone like Yanukovych. Also, Putin has gotten away with somebody before. So he took the territories of Georgia, of Abkhazia, and South Ossetia, and the international community objected, but they didn't do anything. Um, and so he has, but of course, taking over all of Ukraine as a country is a bit different, a lot different. So I don't think he had any reason to expect this would go well. I think he got bad information and is maybe not firing on all cylinders. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and also he did not expect such a big support from the West. That was the yep. biggest thing yep. that he did not count. I think because he underestimated Ukrainians. It was yeah. Crimea, Crimea was yeah. a bomb idea, nothing happened. Yeah, and then exactly. was Syria. So yeah. you see, like he turned, so nothing right. was from West. So Georgia, nothing. So he was thinking exactly the same. But especially if he could do it quickly. Like in Crimea is a great yes. example. Exactly. He took over Crimea and everyone objected, but no one was going to go to war over it. Yeah. And so, so if he could have taken it over quickly, how yeah. yeah. he didn't expect that. Yeah. Our exit from Afghanistan didn't help us. For the Ukrainian situation? How so? Well, I just think that uh, Putin looked at that and thought, wow, what an opportunity the U.S. is yes. pulling out and they're mm -hmm. leaving all their right. arms all over the place. That's and what they want to get out of there. Maybe. Um, although I would think, and I'm not a military strategist, but I, I, I would think, too, the fact that the U.S. pulled out of one conflict would potentially free up our resources to send troops. Now, the likelihood that the U.S. sends troops to Ukraine is not high even now. Yeah. But it could. Uh, and the fact that we're not in Afghanistan would make that, I would think, easier. Um, but I'm not sure that I'm not sure that Putin really had a rational thought process on this or good in, and or good information. I think he really thought he wanted to do this, and I think he thought he could. Um, I know he, yeah. I'm wondering, and I realize I'm asking you to look into this irrational mind, but if he just wanted to add to Russia or perhaps start recreating the USSR, it would seem to me that the stands that were part of the USSR would have been an easier target than the Ukraine. And is there just some deep seated need for the Russians to claim the Ukraine? Putin seems to have a, of the uh, stands are too. So Putin seems to have a unique fixation on taking over Ukraine, and I think that he believes his own propaganda that Russia is entitled to it and they're Slavs and we should be able to take care. I think he believes his own propaganda. Now, taking over Central Asian countries, um, 
Kazakhstan has a lot of money, but the other Central Asian countries uh, are generally very poor and would require a lot of subsidies and would be hard to like, it would be a mess to take them over. It would be expensive and not worth it. And I, I think he's uniquely fixated on Ukraine and taking over that. Um, yeah, I thank can you. Answer, I can add something that some of the Asian countries does not need uh, to be occupied by army because already pro-Russia yeah. government. <clears throat> That's right. And people does not have, again, same right inside of Russia. They don't have really big access like Turkmenistan is can be a very rich, big Asian country, but it's poor as country because they don't have real, real internet people to see what's going on around. So it's pro-Russian government mostly yeah. on this type of country. Yeah, I mean, they're not quite puppets, I, but that's true that Russia can more easily exert influence over those countries without invading them. Mm -hmm. For the most part, Kazakhstan's a big exception. And there have been a lot of exciting political events in Kazakhstan recently, but, but and I, they wouldn't just go along with Russia um, in, in the same way. Is still pro Russia as has yeah, lost, but lost they, they've they've been them. they've been silent on Ukraine for the most part. So they have not. I, I mean, they're not opposing Russia, but they're not coming out full throated like, yeah. yeah, this is great what you're doing here. Um, Kazakhstan's in an interesting position, and they actually have some leverage because they have oil money. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, yes. Uh, uh, two, two questions, really. Uh, one, now that the United States has been so active, right, in supplying Ukraine, and Russia has said, you know, these, these shipments are targets. Yeah. What do you see as the risk to the United States? You know, American shipments are attacked. That's American involvement. Right. Second, second question, this has to be solved at some point, right? Do you see Ukraine being divided east and west and people in Europe and the United States saying, yeah, that's that's okay, right? And leaving the Ukraine people to deal with. Right. Um, so I'll answer the second <clears throat> question first. Um, so unfortunately and unjustly and unrightly, I worry that the solution to this will be some agreement where Ukraine loses more territory. They're probably not getting Crimea back anytime soon. Um, and the next bit, Luhansk and Donetsk will be the next sort of, are the, the bargaining chips. Zelensky just said like yesterday, and his last night in his nightly right. address said, we can't just give up those territories. People right. live there. You don't understand what that would mean to just give it, like that's not something we can just hand over. Um, I, what I think is one possible scenario that makes things a little better is there could be not a peace agreement, but a ceasefire in which Russia essentially controls Donetsk and Luhansk. Um, and there's a ceasefire that we maybe we go back to what existed in 2015. Maybe. I'm not tremendously optimistic. They still lose. I'm not Ukraine. very optimistic yeah. right now because the overlap between what the West and what the Ukrainian government will accept and what the Russian government will accept is not very big. And so I'm not terribly optimistic in the short term, except that I think our best bet would be a ceasefire. Your first question about the American shipments and American involvement. Yeah, I think that's a huge risk. There is a continual and huge risk that Russia does something that attacks a NATO member country like Poland. All they have to do is have a shelling that crosses the border right. in Poland and they've attacked a NATO country. Right. And then, yeah, we have a very real risk of direct war with Russia. This is why Biden didn't want to declare a no-fly zone over Ukraine, because as soon as he did that, that was effectively a declaration of war, and they didn't want to go to war directly with Russia. Um, and so I could, but I think that's a continual risk as long as we're doing this. Um, yes, here and then. Okay. And we have one on Zoom too, just so oh, okay. you know. I know there's a lot of uh, webs that go through the place, and all this politically is all happening. My concern is humanitarian. I know that um, Ukraine provides so much that people don't know. Uh, minerals, all that's like 21% of the world's uh, calories. Where are these shipments to reportedly been going to? And is there a world risk now of famine? 
you know, another reason to get this over with, but it's going to affect the world. Yes, that's a short answer. Yes, there's a risk of famine in certain countries, especially developing countries that get imports from Ukraine. Uh, there's some African countries that have already expressed concern about this, that it's exacerbating uh, food shortages in those countries. Um, the likelihood of a global recession is still uh, significant uh, because of this. I think that that's more than likely to happen. It's, it's, it, there's better and worse scenarios, but it's, it's probably not going to, there's probably going to be some level of global recession. And I imagine right now there's not a lot of uh, farming going on. Uh, no, I mean, so the western part is the more agricultural part of the country, and the eastern is the more industrial. So what Putin did by taking over or by interfering with fighting in the eastern part of the country was took a lot of wealth from the Ukrainian government, from industrial production and revenues and that kind of thing. The agricultural part's mostly in the western part, which you're absolutely right. The country's been decimated for three months. I mean, they don't have infrastructure has to be rebuilt. They have to be able to ship things, they have to be able to farm things. And, that can't happen in the same way right now, even in the western part of the country. Um, and so, you know, some people talk about like the divided Ukraine question, like if they just gonna split the country, but that will be horrifically heartbreaking if that happens. Um, I think it's not impossible that that happens. Um, although what Putin has accomplished, oddly, is he's unified Ukrainian politics, which is like, so would it be deeply politically polarized countries? I, I mean, as polarized as the U.S. Um, is right now, about uh, more even. Uh, but he unified Ukrainian politics. He unified Europe. He got two new NATO members. Like Finland and Sweden are most likely joining NATO now. Like Putin has created the world that he said he wanted to to prevent. Uh, but it will absolutely cause those problems. I I don't think there's even really a question. Yeah. Um, there was a question already. Well, I had a question about Finland, but you just commented on it. Okay. Not, what is your opinion on that? Because now there are putting sticks in the wheel to Russia for them. So I wonder if that's kind of opinion is truly going to happen. And my second question is because now all that is being signed and confirmed and everything. I know the numbers show that all the proof, but only on the in the words, we truly our our army, I think, for that from Ukraine, don't see the support. And now they're talking about a couple months. And two months is the time. information and videos and everything that we get from our country, two months is, is done. And weeks, we're counting hours, seconds, minutes, hard cap. It has been bombed today and stuff. So so do you, why do you think the Western countries and stuff are holding up on that? Why did they, why do we the why the uh, Aviation and tanks, none of that is getting supplied, which is a part of the requirements. I think what we're coming up against is a real test of how long Russia is willing to hold out on these sanctions and how much the West is willing to suffer as a result of the sanctions. The sanctions hurt everybody. They hurt both the countries opposing them and Russia. The hope is that they hurt Russia more, and they hurt Russia more in the short term and then lead to some kind of change. That's the hope. But as we see Russia do things like cut off gas, cut off oil, um, if, uh, you know, with Finland getting into NATO officially, I don't know if that'll officially happen. Um, I think that it terrifies Russia, the idea that Finland, because it's right there on the border, right? Um, and so um, I think, though, what the Western countries are starting to face is there's going to be a limit to their domestic political support in countries like Finland and Sweden in the West, that they don't think what Putin and Russia are doing is right. How much are they willing to suffer or sacrifice to help? And, and that, that is a heartbreaking dilemma and a very classic political one. Um, that I think that what they're coming up again is domestic political will. How much are people willing to pay for gas in the, in the winter? How much are they willing to do that? And for how long, right? Um, and uh, yeah. I think now is the time to show Russia that they're willing to do it for as long as they need to, to get Russia to back down. But you're going to see variation across countries in their willingness to do it. Yeah. I was going to ask you a number of questions. And I was super excited that uh, to know that you are a fluent Russian speaker, as well as you spent uh, 20 years of your career going to that country. I'm very curious on your insight and your professional opinions about the Russian mentality, because it's not every nationality that would agree to 
fulfill the bloody orders of the president. There are nations yeah. that would say, like they said to the Russian ship, go yeah. and up yourself. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so and there are right. nations like that. There are nations that who, which mentality is very peaceful. Yeah. It's either their religion or their personal beliefs, but they why everybody wants to keep money in the Swiss bank. Why everybody wants to own rocks made in um, in Europe and things like that. So in your opinion, what is that about the Russian mentality that allows them and allows to have a president who gives orders like that? That's uh, one part. Second piece to my question is that I've been listening to the interviews of the Russian mothers, the soldiers, and yeah. you said you know somebody personally who has the son yeah. in the, yeah. um, in the work. A lot of them openly say that those people, those soldiers were not informed what they were doing. Yeah. They found out after the fact where they are and yeah. what they are supposed to be doing. So, what did it take? Like, how did the clown was able to perform the trick? Did he have the audience drunk that he was able to perform these tricks? I mean, was the audience high that they were not critically uh, analyzing? Or was the audience like so poor that they were desperate for the $300 that they were promising them? Like a little carrot in yeah. front of the horse's uh, mouth. Yeah. So I'm very curious in your analysis of the Russian mentality. So how, what made it real? What made it uh, possible to, to be happy? Yeah, I think, but there, so there's, a, that's such a good question. And it's such a, like, there's a lot of complicated questions about the Russian mentality and why this worked and why mm -hmm. this worked for so long. Yeah, and why his approval ratings are so high? Uh -huh. Right now they are, but he's going to see them fall. He's Putin is in actually in a very bad situation because his economy is about to tank. It's right. already tanking, and so he won't maintain those approval ratings. He's mm -hmm. got them for now. I think that the Kremlin propaganda has this really effective kind of switch and bait. Like they can change the topic in this very like clever but evil way. And I don't mm -hmm. usually in a professional sense use the word evil, but <laughs> here it seems appropriate. Um, okay. That uh, you know the responses to getting in an argument with someone who's listening to Russian propaganda mm -hmm. is mind-bogglingly bad. So uh, Anya, who I've known for 20 years, her son is Andre, who's in the Russian army. I posted something anti-war on, on social media, and Anya sent me a list of every time the U.S. had invaded another country. And I was like, well, okay, yeah, I probably don't. I don't agree with some of those wars, and like, I'm not saying the U.S. government's good. What does that have to do with Russia invading Ukraine right now? Like, <laughs> that doesn't have any. And so there's this sort of like, these Western countries are hypocrites. Look, they do bad things too. Um, look, they are hurting ethnic Russians, and we need to do this. It's not our fault. It's heartbreaking that they do it. We're going to do it. Um, and so I think that that propaganda, and alternate reality, and control of the media. Mm -hmm. The pretty savvy control of the media explains a lot of this. <laughs> right, but on the other hand, the Russians were allowed to travel. They were issued visas. There were a number of Russians visiting the United States, you know, getting some. Yeah, but it wasn't that easy for Russians to come yeah. to the U.S. on a, on a travel. Yeah. Like, I mean, it was actually quite hard. I, I wanted to invite friends to my wedding, but they couldn't, like, there was no way to get them a visa. Right, uh -huh. to come to the US. It was much easier for me as an American to go to Russia uh -huh. than for mm -hmm. them to come here on a tourist. Yeah, but on the other hand, the internet. Well, they did have a lot of exposure. Yeah, so I think the internet is not Yeah, yeah. Well, the internet Russia. Russia. Yeah. In Russia. And yeah. also, I'm just curious as a human being, when you are told one opinion, as a human being, curiosity being one of the features of a human being, you are curious, huh? Is this the only possible opinion or there are a number of others that yeah. is worth exploring? So why do you think it works with the Russian nation? You're gonna have Once they research and they believe. I think that most people don't seek out alternative resources. And so unless you're very motivated or very right. curious. Do you think you it, says it has something to do with education? Yes and no. Um, so there is a big urban rural divide in Russia. So mm -hmm. you've got modern wealthy European cities like St. Petersburg and Moscow, 
which are not like most of the country, which right. are rural and are dying. And some of these towns are dying out. They don't have basic services going to them. The roads, the infrastructure is not good. Right. So you take an electric, you know, a, yeah, right. An, an hour, hour out of Moscow, right. and you're in a different world, right, right. than you are in downtown Moscow. Uh -huh. Some of it is that there is higher support recruitment in rural populations. Mm -hmm. He has sold them some people on this myth of we need to create Russia as a superpower. The West looks down on us. They make fun of us. We need to reclaim our sphere of influence, and that's compelling to people. Russians are suspicious of NATO. Like mm -hmm. even when in just in this past December they didn't want to invade Ukraine, they're like, yeah, but NATO is out to get us probably. Um, and so they play on that very effectively. Um, so and you even my friends that are well educated, if I ask them, like, uh, you know, what do you think of the war? They're like, well, come on, Ukrainian politics is pretty corrupt. There's bad things going on there. I, he probably has a good reason to like be involved. Right? And these are not uneducated people. Mm -hmm. um, do you think it's kind of a war of the archetype? They are kind of playing on what is at the core. The Russians always want a strong political figure, like father tsar, batushka tsar. You understand? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Father tsar. Yeah. And we are like the children. Yeah. We follow yeah. the strong hand, the iron hand, the iron fist. You know? Because that's what a lot of Russian monuments yeah. are, you know? Right. The Russian yeah. fist or Lenin's finger pointing to the right direction. I'm and everybody follows, you know, blind or blind or whatever. Blind or whatever. Yeah. They follow the strong hands. For sure. So I do think that culturally and historically, Russians have not been sold as competitive democracy mm -hmm. because the period of experience with democracy in Russia was very limited. It was the 90s. It was chaotic. There was lots of corruption, lots of killings, a uh, lot of very unstable financial crises. People lost their life savings to the extent that they had right. them. Right. Uh, Lots of things in the 90s. And then Putin comes in in the early 2000s, oil prices go up, things get stable, the country gets wealthier. And Putin did in the early 2000s do a number of things that made the government run better. Mm -hmm. So he got popular for some good old fashioned kind of democratic type reasons, but he actually did get some things to work better. He very quickly pivoted to making the country more authoritarian and centralized in power. Mm -hmm. um, the country gets yeah. more. Uh, the country or Moscow is your name? I think it's kind of yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. Moscow yeah. and not Russia. Because what yeah. we oh. see right now, the people who are fighting in Ukraine, the soldiers, those are um, rural community soldiers brought all the way from East yeah. and have never seen civilized world. If you want to oh, so, yeah, mm -hmm. Russia still has a mandatory draft. You're supposed to serve um, two years at least. Uh, and so Putin initially said, oh, don't worry, we're not sending conscripts to Ukraine. And then the Ministry of Defense said, we definitely are. And Putin <laughs> said, oh, well, we need to find the people who didn't obey my orders to send conscripts, not send conscripts. But they don't have the people without sending those conscripts. And you're right. The people who actually do the military service are people who can't buy the certificate to say they've done it because that's a common, there's like a black market, like commonly known right. price. You just buy a thing to get a paper that says you did it. Or you can get a higher education exception. So the people that actually serve the mandatory military draft are from poor rural regions a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times. They don't have other opportunities. They likely did not know fully what they were doing. There's some anecdotal evidence that soldiers were told they were engaging in military exercises in Ukraine okay. until live fire was returned. And they're like, wait, <laughs> that's not an exercise. Um, I don't know how pervasive that was or how true. I know there's stories about that. Um, the mentality issue, I feel like now I studied Russia in this golden age of the early 2000s when it looked like things might be okay and they're not now. Um, and it was just this little blip. Because from 2010 onwards, things have not been great. Um, I think there's Zoom yeah, questions, thanks, though. Sarah, so, yeah. Sarah. So, um, and this is from a few minutes ago, but how does it make sense in light of the comment about poor countries? We were talking about former members of the USSR at that time um, to destroy through special operations what territories they gain. So, I guess it's sort of what benefit is there in taking over an area that's been bombed? Destroy. Oh, Putin just wants to control Ukraine is the answer. Like, I, I think he wants to, but this has been the goal throughout the 2000s. Yeltsin less so, because Yeltsin as the president in the 1990s, he had problems at home. He could not have worried about taking over Ukraine if he'd wanted to. And he probably, I don't think he did by all accounts. But Yeltsin had to fight wars in Chechnya. 
which was the war of the 90s, any of late 90s, uh, where Russian soldiers were killed and there was ultimately mm -hmm. opposition to that. Mm -hmm. that. Yeah, and that in the late 90s, like the apartment bombing, yeah. yeah. Um, so Putin really wanted to go into Chechnya too and take that over and he more or less did. He did mm -hmm. that pretty successfully. But the 2000s, Putin has wanted to control Ukrainian politics. So he's consistently tried to interfere in elections to back Yanukovych, um, to give money to Yanukovych and his campaign um, and to help him win so that he would have a pro-Russian president in Ukraine at the very least, um, but wanted Ukraine to sign security and economic agreements, didn't want Ukraine to even think about a hint of a notion of NATO, but didn't want them in the EU for sure. Um, and so that it's very consistent, like, yeah, it doesn't make sense to bomb a country and then be like, this is really valuable, but Putin's goal is to control the country. So, yeah. Um, yes. I think it's interesting too to, to appreciate how the Russian people think. You have to go back to World War II and their fears that, you know, somebody had brought up earlier, you know, why is it important? Buffers have been important to them. Yeah. You know, because their country's been overrun so often and and when you think that we lost 470,000 troops in World War II, they lost 25 million people. Yep. And, yeah. and so consequently, all their family histories are just horrible with them. Yeah. And so then here comes this guy, uh, you know, Putin, who's a manly man and he's a, you know, a strong leader and all of that. They, you know, they're, they're very supportive. And um, NATO has, Putin's warned the world for and NATO for years. Just don't try it. Just don't bring NATO to my my yeah. doorstep. What would you do? And what we do with the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis? And he asked the question: What would what would the United States do if they put nuclear weapons in Mexico? You know, and so that may not make a lot of sense to us, but it makes a hell of a lot of sense to those people because of their history. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you that Russians do not think that most Americans sufficiently appreciate the sacrifice they made for World War II. That well, that's we right. Were... At least 20, 25 million Russians is the number that's most often cited um, of people killed. And they consider and, our involvement yeah. a sideshow. But not just Russians, Soviets. Yeah. That's right. Oh, yeah, not just ethnic Russians. Russians. Mm -hmm. That's right. But Soviets. And this is also part of the reason that as a historical figure, Stalin is quite popular because he's seen as a hero of World War II. Who won that? Who won World War II and then modernized the country, right? So most Americans, like they hear Stalin, they think gulags and they think repression. Those things are all true, right? He did Stalin kill a lot of people. Russians, though, are more likely to associate it with winning World War II, modernizing the country, right? And what they'll point to is they'll say, "Well, but you Amer like it's the switch and bait again. It's like, well, you Americans, like you're proud of things, but your country's done bad stuff too. We're proud of things, our country's done bad stuff. It's a false equivalency. It's like, oh, it's all the same. Like some of us do bad things, some of us do good things, and you're just being uh, unreasonable about this. The NATO comparison, uh, some people think that Putin and Russia have a right or are justified in their concern about NATO expansion, but NATO's actually been quite stable since, the, <laughs> since 2000. <laughs> it, it's, they, the Baltic countries in the 90s joined, and that was a big deal. And there was a concern about Russian reaction. But NATO has been quite stable in its scope. I can quiet that. the whole period. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Do you know how big NATO was when the Soviet Union uh, broke apart? How big NATO was at well, that time? Well, it's got members were, from like Poland. There, there were 14 members. Like Wait, there were 14 members. The Russian government was assured that Russia would be secure and NATO would not encroach. NATO is now 30 nations all boarded. This is the NATO. All the, the, the key, though, the key so, though, is that this all happened in the 90s and it's 2022. Yeah, I got that. So part, after but 20 years away, they decided that that was the threat they had. Though. I, I didn't yeah. interrupt when you were speaking. Basically, the West. And the United States has reneged on every assurance that was given to Russia. That's just post 1990. That's just yeah. That's not uh, absolutely, absolutely. There, there was they they had agreed that there would be no rapid expansion in NATO. NATO was doubled in size. Is that the American right, definition? Would, why would NATO what I would emphasize though is that that happened in the 90s, and Putin used that as a justification in 2022. 
that all of a sudden an expansion that happened two decades earlier was a reason that he had to, and Ukraine was never considered for NATO. So are, are you requesting Russia to forget about the U.S. and the West reneging on those important commitments? There was no commitment that countries like Poland were going to get to NATO. I'm not talking about Poland. We're talking about all the newly formed independent states. Well, like that there's, came after so the there's 15, dissolution of 15 Soviet. republics in the Soviet Union become 15 independent countries. The only ones that join NATO are the Baltic countries. The other post-communist countries that join were part of the Warsaw Pact, but they were not part of the Soviet Union. So, if you're so there's in, no reneging on it. If, right. if you're in Russia's shoes and you see NATO double in size, you're going to tell me you don't see that as a threat? You probably should have done it in the early 2000s then. The timing doesn't make any sense. Well, you say if you try to see it as a threat, make well, them we, attack we, another We country. shouldn't at this point be saying what should have been done in the 90s because the West. I think that the key here is that Putin uses that as a boogeyman. Absolutely. Putin uses NATO as a boogeyman to scare Russians. Absolutely. That happened in the 90s. This That's is correct. 20 years later. That's NATO correct. has not been expanding recently, there's been no discussion well, of it. They, won't they, just, they expanded in the 90s, which I mean, yes, I know historically the 90s are not that long ago, but. The timing of it doesn't make a lot of sense for him to suddenly claim that NATO is a threat to Russia. And what's actually happened is that in pursuing that foreign policy <laughs> from, his, from Putin's worldview, he has created the world he feared. He's I, created a unified Europe. He's created a unified NATO. He's created a unified yeah, Ukraine, I which like, was unthinkable in 95. I, I, I agree with that. Yeah. You can't forget that the West went in. I don't and think that the West re niche, though. I don't agree with that. The doubling of NATO is not. They didn't promise not to double the size of NATO. That was never, there was no promise by NATO that said we're not going to expand to post communist countries that are independent sovereign countries now. And I ones that were never, I, Poland was never in the Soviet Union. I totally agree. So, but I want to ask you, to, uh, sir, what about Syria? What was the, what was the deal there that Russia had that they could? What was the Afghanistan before Syria? What was in Kyrgyzstan? What was the year you have come? So it was before Georgia. Then was 2008 for Georgia. Where was NATO? Russia, does Putin can but, find anything? Well, I agree. He has he, in his uh, mind I, wait, wait, to agree. make a reason, right? I so because he agree. wants to. Putin is politicizing this. But the fact is, NATO has neither prevented any wars, nor won any wars since it's formed. Well, that's a whole separate question. No, no, that's, that's, that's a whole separate question. No, it's not, because you have to ask, is NATO a legitimate threat or not? And it's not it meant to be a threat. It's meant to, well, so that's, I think the, then you get into a, a debatable issue if it's meant to be a threat. It's a security organization, it's which is a military security. organization, Correct. which in a sense is inherently threatening. But the danger, I think, in saying that, oh, I can see why Putin is scared of NATO, is that it doesn't really, it mischaracterizes it because he uses NATO as a boogeyman. I He's agree. not using it as a sincere threat. So saying, I understand why Putin is concerned about NATO, there's not really a basis in reality for it. But this is how clever he is I in, in, in the explanation. Like, and this is I when he comes up agree. with this like version of Ukrainian history, which is like this historical fantasy. He does it in these clever ways that are like, there are like teeny tiny kernels of truth that he just completely yeah, commits yes. into like that whatever plays, reality that, wants. That yeah. plays to the emotions. To that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like Which to a lot of politicians do. Plays to the emotion within his culture. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm skeptical of these like Russians are inherently tied to this type of leader. I, but historically, it has been true. Historically, certain so leaders have been true. Um, yeah, if that's because of the political economy of the country or the strategic not, or the culture, I can't, you know, but yeah, it's time. That's a really good I thing. think I have to thank you. It's really, yeah, you'll have to come again. You do that. Yeah. Yeah.